Welcome to ILTV's Insider. I'm Steve Leibowitz. We're entering the era of the second Trump presidency. Still President Trump, uh, President-elect Trump for another two months. Donald Trump is already trying to influence and also formulate policy as it relates to the big picture crisis and the multi-front war between Israel and its enemies. Let's get right into it. Joining me now are two experts in U.S. policy and the Middle East. Dr. Gerald Steinberg is a political scientist at Bar Ilan University and the head and founder of NGO Monitor and an expert on the art of negotiation or the art of the deal, as President-elect like, uh, Trump likes to say. And Amots Asael is an author and columnist and expert on the real politic at play currently in our region. What a moment in history, really. Gerald, let me start with you. The president-elect is in Mar-a-Lago, and guess what? He's not waiting quietly to assume the presidency. There have already been several phone conversations between Donald Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu. They reportedly discussed the multi-front wars and the expected attack from Iran. What do you think was the substance? They've talked to each other a lot. They know each other from many years ago, from the previous Trump uh, administration. And there's clear, I wouldn't say necessarily bad blood, but there's a lot of friction between the Netan Netanyahu. I, I'm not sure it makes sense to talk about the Netanyahu government. Netanyahu, prime minister, and the Biden administration. And there's an alternative now, and that is Trump. It's going to be, I think, what, 70 days from now, roughly, that Trump takes over. At, given the fact that we've been at war for 400 plus days, that's not a huge amount of time. Now there's an alternative. And Netanyahu can say to the pressures from from Biden, some may be justified, some not, that we're going to wait for the better, for the, for the alternative. We don't have to listen to the uh, demands that you make, for instance, for a humanitarian aid, which will allow Hamas people to maintain fighters to continue their presence in, in northern Gaza and continue attack and kill Israeli soldiers. We can wait for a better, more realistic approach to dealing with Lebanon. That's a possibility. He can use that as leverage. Now, I'm not saying that both up, uh, discussions, both in terms of, of what's going on in Gaza and a ceasefire in Lebanon, are not going to happen before January 20th, but it does provide more leverage, not only vis-a-vis -vis the Biden administration, but also vis-a-vis -vis Iran, Hezbollah, and the remnants of Hamas. Those are all, all important, and I think Netanyahu is, is making uh, using that as leverage. Amots, the Biden administration sent a threatening letter on October 13th saying that there had to be a significant change in humanitarian aid or else U.S. arms for the Gaza war could be impacted. The warnings are in place and the deadline is tomorrow. It's a lame duck administration. Is this payback time for the differences between Biden and Netanyahu? I don't know about uh, the Biden administration's um, uh, actions and their effectiveness in upcoming days. I, I am quite sure, however, that uh, in the broader scheme of things, this no longer matters. What matters is what will begin once uh, Trump uh, succeeds Biden. <clears throat> and in this regard, we already know who the, um, the next secretary of state is. And I think that his attitude has already made it plain will be entirely different. He sees no humanitarian case against Israel. Clearly, he sees only humanitarian case against Hamas. Marco Rubio. You're talking about Marco Rubio, yes? Yes, I am. Okay. And um, uh, I think in this regard, he clearly overlaps the Israeli consensus. So this is in terms of the American attitude towards what is happening um, down in the field right now between us and Gaza. Looking to the more distant horizon, I think that the joker will be Russia and Trump's unique relationship with its leader. Uh, there is plenty negative to say about that relationship, and I personally have said it already repeatedly. However, in terms of our situation, it may actually bear some benefit for everyone, especially for Israel, because Russia has sway in the broader Lebanese theater through its position in Syria. And uh, this is a kind of sway that America currently does not enjoy there due to the mistakes that uh, were made back in the Obama administration in Syria, which are all water under the bridge. 
What matters now is the quest, everyone's quest, to somehow impact or, or produce out of the current violence a redesigned Lebanon. For that, you need Russia, and Trump might actually harness it. All right, I'd like to take a closer look at the potential ceasefire currently being hyped in Lebanon. President-elect Trump is being advised on the issue by a relative. In this case, it's not his Jewish son-in-law, Jared Kushner, who served in the last Trump administration, but rather the father of his other son-in-law. Tiffany Trump's father-in-law, Masad Boulos, is a key surrogate for the U.S. president-elect. Boulos is also a wealthy Lebanese-American businessman who advocated for the president with the American Arab voters in Michigan. Let's just hear a few of the words from this man who's reportedly trying to help broker a deal in Lebanon in the coming days. ...is the war in the Middle East. They've seen the huge difference in the approach and in the track record of the two administrations. And the, uh, they've seen uh, Donald Trump for four years in the White House. There were no wars. He was the only president in modern history that didn't start uh, any war. He ended wars. He withdrew U.S. troops. And he's a man of peace. He's the only one in recent history who was able to achieve four Abraham Accords. And he was about to achieve the fifth one with Saudi Arabia. And many other countries were, yeah, Arab yeah, countries were lined up. fell on Joe Biden's watch. So, Gerald, uh, here's a man who has um, got the president's ear. Sometimes that's the person that influences, influences him most, apparently. Um, and he wants to expand the uh, Abraham Accords mov moving forward. The man certainly is in pain over what's happening in his homeland. Can he actually impact a, a, a ceasefire even before Trump comes into office? Let's be honest. The real, the major actor here is Iran. What happens in Tehran is far more significant than what happens in Beirut or what happens with, uh, within Trump's uh, inner circle and his family circle and everybody else. And the question is whether Iran is interested, the Iranian regime is interested in putting their weight behind an agreement. Uh, we don't really know. It's very hard to read the tea leaves. Uh, I think that the, the election of Trump has really been a shock in Tehran uh, because They've got an open uh, ledger with them. Uh, all the nice things that uh, we heard about Trump ignores the fact that he was the one who ordered the, uh, the uh, targeted killing, I almost said assassination, the targeted killing of Soleimani. And that's an open wound for the Iranian regime. He was a, a major player, the most important, most high level Iranian or revolutionary guard figure in the entire Iran military proxy framework. And by uh, having him assassinated, the Trump administration, the fir first Trump administration, really changed the region. And so that, that ledger is still open. And uh, the Iranian regime may decide that it's in their interests, both because of the hits that they've taken from Israel, but what they're likely to get with a new administration, with a Trump administration, from we've seen from the appointments, we've seen from the statements that have been made, that uh, they, may, they may decide that uh, discretion is the, uh, was it the better choice of the valor and uh, pull back and therefore agree to terms that Israel can accept in terms of uh, an arrangement in Lebanon with Hezbollah. If Iran decides that, Hezbollah has no choice. I think Hezbollah is also hurting. They've been hurt a lot by the Israeli attacks. But Israel's also hurting. I think that's also important. This has been a very painful couple, more than the whole year and a half has been, or a year and whatever it is, uh, 13 months has been very painful. But uh, the last two months or so in Lebanon, Israel's taking casualties. Israel's still getting hit on a daily basis by rockets. We've done significant damage to the Hezbollah hierarchy, to their weapons storages, storage uh, capabilities and other aspects. So it may be the time, what's called in the business, a mutual hurting stalemate to reach some sort of an agreement. And uh, Trump may be the one who can bring it across. Amots, let me ask you about that. The new defense minister, Israel Katz, says that Hezbollah is defeated, but the IDF said it's preparing to deepen the war. The, the number of rockets toward Israel is growing. Uh, I think the, rocket, the number of rockets just fired toward Haifa Bay. Uh, one today landed in a kindergarten. Luckily, the kindergarten uh, teacher took the kids into a shelter, even though the 
Red alert wasn't sounded. A, a tragedy was prevented. Are we heading toward a ceasefire or an expanding war? And is Biden and his envoy, Amos Hochstein, calling the shots or Trump and others uh, with other considerations? Well, first of all, Israel Katz's pronouncement is, is very unfortunate and uh, ill-conceived and sadly a continuation of his, of his performance as foreign minister and frankly does not warrant much of a discussion. It's clearly aloof and, and was uh, received throughout Israel very negatively. That's about him. Uh, concerning Amos Ochstein, he's clearly no Kissinger uh, in terms of his stature and certainly in terms of his position right now as he represents a lame duck government. I don't see him producing here anything that we will be able to celebrate. <clears throat> Maybe something will hatch before the transition of power, but it's not going to be thanks to that particular individual. If anything hatches, it's going to be not because of any mediator's uh, genius, but because of the, um, the belligerent party's interests. And in terms of that, right now, I perfectly agree with Gerald that the key actor is Iran. And Iran, we can see, is extremely um, cautious and calculating in terms of uh, what happened in America, which clearly did not uh, suit its hopes. And um, it, it does not want to do anything rash. This we've seen in their conduct along the years, and particularly in such an unpredictable situation right now. This does not mean that they will not do anything rash, but it does mean that they would like to not this is what they would like to avoid. So um, uh, I don't know to say whether these people in Tehran uh, will understand just how explosive everything they're tinkering with actually is. But it is. And therefore, chances are high that a deal will hatch even before uh, the transition of power in Washington. The question, therefore, besides the big question of whether or not a deal hatches, is what the deal's contours will be. And uh, in this regard, I'm extremely pessimistic. I'm pessimistic not because of the Lebanese government's attitude, not because of America, not because of Israel, but because of Hezbollah. Nobody down there is in a position to actually make it silence its guns. We can sign with the United States whatever they and us would like to do. None of that will impact the, the, the militia over there directly. The only ones who can silence them are the Iranians, and no one knows how to make them do that. So let's talk more about the Iranians. Gerald Netanyahu confirmed that he and Trump discussed Iran and their multiple talks since the election. The Iran threat and presumably uh, uh, its nuclearization uh, during the coming four years. Do you think that there could be a plan for a combined U.S.-Israel attack on the Iranian nukes once Trump comes to office or some new deal of some sort? This is uh, maybe above my pay, rel pay raise, <laughs> pay level, that's the word I'm looking for. I want to go back for a second to the, what Amos said and add or re return Russia back into the picture. I think, Amos, you mentioned it at the beginning, but I, Russia seems to be a player here. There were reports that Ron Dermer, who is Netanyahu's main strategic uh, advisor, let's face it, the two new ministers that were appointed, particularly the new minister of defense, uh, Israel Katz, is not really in office. He doesn't really have a role. But Ron Dermer does. Dermer knows Trump. He knows the people around Trump. He also knows the Biden people. And there were reports that he was in Russia. That's an interesting combination. I don't quite understand what's in it for Putin. We can speculate a little bit about prestige, maybe being welcomed back into the international arena if he's interested in all in that, given the war in, the, in Ukraine and trying to perhaps reach an agreement. But if Russia has an interest in reaching an agreement, ceasefire in Lebanon, they have significant presence in Syria. They, they're really very strong and they can do a lot of uh, maneuvering in, in Syria pressing the Assad regime, which is linked to Hezbollah, and therefore, and they have this alliance with Iran. So if we're going to have an agreement, I think uh, it's, it's going to have to involve Russia. Russia's going to have to roll up its sleeves and help to force Hezbollah to at least meet the Israeli demands. I don't know how that's going to be done. All this sounds to me a little bit very much uh, hocus pocus. 
But uh, because it's on the table, I think it's worth discussing. As for your question about whether uh, a joint Israeli-American military operation against the uh, Iranian nuclear capability is a possibility in the next administration, yeah, it's a possibility because both leaders, both countries have said they won't tolerate an Iranian nuclear capability. Uh, the, the clock is ticking. Uh, Iran does not have a deliverable weapon. It might take a couple more years. Uh, certainly, the Israeli attacks that have very much weakened the Iranian defenses and early warning system present that as an opportunity. But whether or not that's going to be a priority and the costs that are involved in doing that come uh, January 20th, I think, still is a major open question. And I, I just leave it at that. We can come back uh, sometime in six months and see where we stand. I'm not, uh, it, I wanted to ask about the role of, uh, of Doha, uh, Qatar, in this now. They've just pulled out of the mediation yet again. Earlier, they had thrown Hamas out and sent them to Turkey. Then they were brought back so that they could continue mediation. Now they're out. Is this kind of hold me back, hold me back? Are they trying to be drawn back in by the Biden administration? Or are they out? And is Hamas going to be thrown out of Doha? Um, that Hamas will be thrown out of Doha, the only thing we know is the um, announcement that it will be. To predict whether the announcement will actually be followed by action, I am unequipped. But I do have my thought about what happened uh, more deeply between Qatar and the United States. I think that the United States, the people deep in the corridors of power in America have understood that the unrest in American campuses last year was partly at least fueled by Qatari money. This does not mean necessarily that it was uh, micromanaged uh, from Qatar, but from an American viewpoint, from the viewpoint of the American national interest, foreign money was clearly used in order to destabilize America from within, which is something America cannot possibly tolerate under any administration. My theory is that this is part of an American response to that. America is demanding that they be thrown out. That's what you're America saying? America is telling Qatar, you've lost our trust. Hmm. You've lost our trust as seekers of peace as mediators, as any of these grand roles that you would like to assume, we don't believe you're any of that. You're something else, something more sinister, much more suspect, and we need to keep you at arm's length. I think that's what they're saying. This is, of course, while America keeps on Qatari soil a huge military presence that continues to be uh, rewarding from the point of view of both sides. So you have here yet another one of multiple uh, Middle Eastern contradictions. So I'll go further than I'm looking. No, I, I agree with everything he said, but I think that uh, because of those contradictions, Qatar leadership has played a double game for years. I don't think they were ever mediators. They were mouthpieces, they were spokespeople for the Hamas leadership. They were dragging out the negotiations. They were expressing what uh, Hamas wanted from the very beginning, which is a complete ceasefire, all Israeli forces out of Gaza terms that no Israeli government could agree to, certainly not the Netanyahu government could agree to. And, by, and they, they protected Hamas. They protected the Hamas leadership that was in, in Qatar. Now, I'm a little bit skeptical. Yeah, there are tensions, and I agree with Amos, because of the campus uh, uh, violence. Well, those weren't protests. Massive violence, mob violence on university campuses. Clearly, there was Qatar money involved in that. That's made a major difference. That's created a lot of friction in the relationship between Qatar and the U.S. So they're saying, well, we're going to throw out, we're not going to uh, provide uh, shelter to the Hamas leaders that have been here. But they haven't done anything to do that. And there have been some contradictory terms. So I certainly agree that until they actually do anything, let's, let's keep all of this public statements as on that level of headlines that may not be significant. But they do in some ways uh, illustrate the, the tensions that are there and the, that have uh, erupted uh, over the last few weeks uh, and have changed the relationship significantly. What Hamas leaders, where they would go, where well, there's been speculation, they might go to Turkey, they might go someplace else, we can leave open. But right now they're still, still in Wisconsin, Qatar.
All right, we're almost out of time. I did want at least a final comment, a brief one from each of you about the potential for the expansion of the Abraham Accords in the coming years. I mean, it's hard to look that far ahead right now, but um, things could change. The normalization with Saudi Arabia, although I have to say that uh, the comments from the Saudi prince were not all that positive towards us. Amos, any final comment on where you think we're going towards normalization? I think the potential is high, first of all, in terms of Trump's motivation and commitment. He sees in that, and rightly so, a major part of his legacy. It's clearly the most impressive thing that happened during his first presidency, both according to his supporters and according to his detractors. So, and to any, according to any um, objective observant. So he's motivated to further expand that and circumstances because of the current uh, situation's gravity actually um, actually make this even more of uh, a prospect. Um, whether, of course, um, a deal hatches or not depends first and foremost on what will happen with Iran. If Iran, under whatever circumstances, whether from whether, whether external circumstances or internal circumstances, whether deliberate okay. or hazard, if Iran somehow backs off or is removed from the scene in the uh, fashion that we currently know it. In other words, if there is some kind of a regime change over there or regime attitude, then that might happen. Sorry we're out of time on that point, Amots. Thank you. Uh, well, that's all the time we have this evening. Thank you to our guests, Dr. Gerald Steinberg and Amots Asael. For more of the latest updates from Israel, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter at ILTV.TV. Thanks for watching. It's time to bring the hostages home. And shalom from Israel.